We are very fortunate today. We have with us as our guest on the podcast, Ken Blanchard. You know him. If you don't know him, you should know him. I read uh, The One Minute Manager, I don't know exactly when it came out, but at least 25 years ago uh, when, when I first read it. And I have to admit that I was predisposed not to like it. I, I, the idea of a parable book, um, uh, I don't know, it bothered me somehow. And, and I loved it in spite of myself. I think it was <laughs> such a great primer. It was so succinct, so clear, so uh, uh, effectively focused and written in a way where when people were moving into management roles and they said, what book should I read? And they were expecting me to give them some sort of tome or, you know, uh, David McClellan's Social Motivation, 680 pages, which is also a great book. But but nowhere near as, as immediately practical and usable as, as The One Minute Manager was. And so I always suggest that book. And if you're listening to this and you are uh, coming into management, and even if you're an experienced manager, I suggest reading The One Minute Manager because it's both a quick read and the stories stick with you. Today we're here with Ken to talk about his new book, One Minute Mentoring how to find and work with a mentor, and why you'll benefit from being with one. He wrote it with Claire Diaz-Ortiz. Uh, this is, I don't know if it's his 60th book or somewhere around there, because he's written at least around 60 books. Uh, he has sold 21 million copies of his books. He's one of the top 25 most prolific or best-selling authors of all time, according to Amazon. And, uh, and, and all of that while being an actually incredibly nice guy. He's the chief spiritual officer of the Ken Blanchard uh, companies. It tells you a little bit about who he is, both at a practical level and at a soul level. So without further ado, I could go on. Ken, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Well, Peter, it's great to be, be with you. And uh, just a quick comment about the one minute manager, because life is what happens to you when you're planning on doing something else, you know? Right. I got I got invited to a party when we came out on sabbatical leave to California from University of Massachusetts by a woman who wanted to have authors come together. And I had written a textbook with Paul Hersey, and so I somehow qualified. So, and we're at the party, and Margie meets Spencer Johnson, my wife, and Spencer wrote children's books, this whole series of value tales, the value of sense of humor, the story of Will Rogers, the value of honesty, the story of Abe Lincoln. And so she hand carries them over to me and she says, you guys ought to write a children's book for managers. They won't read anything else. And so he was working on a one minute scolding with a psychiatrist and I invited him to a seminar I was doing. He sat in the back and laughed and all and he came up running at the end. He said, forget parenting. Let's do the one minute manager. But so he's a children's book writer and I'm a storyteller. So we decided to write a parable, you know, about this young man searching for an effective manager. Nobody knew us and who would have ever thunk it, you know. I mean, we were on the Today Show in, in Labor Day, 1982, and it went on the bestseller list uh, the next week and never left for two to three years. You know, it was just a, kind of ridiculous. and. We now have the new One Minute Manager that came out uh, because we hadn't rewritten it because and they needed an e-book. They said, read it, see if you want to make any changes. I read it, Peter, and you, I laughed because he's on his intercom system. Are you using your intercom system today? And everybody he was supervising was gathered right around him. And we changed the One Minute Reprimand to One Minute Redirects, which is much more consistent with the philosophy today of side-by-side leadership. So it's a uh, life is kind of fun to look at the absurdities that get you going, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I was I was interviewed recently and someone was asking me about the sort of strategy of my career. And I, my answer was my career has been deeply unstrategic, you know, that that you right. you look for opportunities that that see and and and, and, I, and I constantly try to move closer towards what gives me joy and what brings value into the world. And I, you can't fully strategize that. You have to try something out and say, huh, this is kind of interesting. And if I tweak it here a little bit, I bet it'll be more fun or I bet it'll add more, more value. And, uh, and it's very you know, opportunistic. That, that gets to why I wrote this book with Claire on mentoring, you know, because I hadn't thought about writing about mentoring, but Claire is in her early 30s and she came to me. She said, Ken, in the past, mentors have always been older and I think us young folks could learn a lot from you older folks. I'm 78, 
And she said, but I think you older folks could learn something from us youngsters, particularly around technology. And so it was, what could we write about cross-generational mentoring? And with the belief, which I hadn't thought about, but I, after I thought about all the co-authors I had, every time you're in a mentor or mentee relationship, both parties learn. And that's the exciting thing about it is that uh, uh, if you stop learning, I think you ought to lie down and let them throw the dirt on you, you know, because you're already dead. You know, I found that to be something so interesting in, in the book. And, and I, I want to share a brief experience, which is that when I first came out of college, I worked with Outward Bound. And, sure. and I did um, paired courses. I ran and course directed paired courses, which were when you took six corporate executives and six urban youth and you put them together. And, and at the beginning, the sense, you know, and the corporate executives paid for the urban youth, so they were paying sort of, you know, covering their costs. And, and there was a sense of, okay, I'm coming in and I'm going to mentor. And then I'll never forget these moments where the corporate executive is, you know, 80 feet up on a ropes course, hanging over the ground, terrified, <laughs> shaking. And, and this 16-year-old kid is looking at him going, I believe in you. You know, you got this. I bet you could do this. <laughs> and, and it was, you know, it's this complete reversal where, where oh. they really kind of understand. And what I loved about this is that it wasn't just, you know, the reverse mentoring, the cross-generational mentoring, the way you described it in the book. It's not just, you know, Josh, who's the mentee, quote, and, and Diane, who's the mentor. It's not just Josh as the mentee teaching Diane about technology, which is sort of the obvious thing, but actually asking deeper questions and helping her think through her, her life career. in a way that I found I wanted you to talk a little bit about because it, it you 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 depict it in a way that went beyond what we traditionally would expect the younger to teach the older. Yeah. In fact, some people said he acted a little bit too smart. You know, I think that a, a great mentoring partnership is somebody who's inquisitive, wants to learn, is a good listener and knows how to ask questions. And uh, no matter what your age is, and so Josh was really good. And, and Diane had been warned by her mentor that if you try to mentor somebody, if, if you go to mentor somebody else, you're going to learn a lot too and put things in perspective. And that's really what, what happened too. Uh, so it was really kind of interesting. And just, you know, my 11-year-old uh, grandson, he mentors me periodically. He'll say, Gramps. You know, <laughs> and then he'll give me some insight, you know, that, that he's had. And it's just marvelous. So talk to us a little bit more about the, you know, maybe just give us a quick rundown for people who want to get a sense of the book and are thinking about kind of wanting to learn about mentoring and mentee relationships. You have a, a, a stepwise process uh, that fits the, the um, term mentor, you know, that the, the it's sort of a mnemonic around mentor, starting with mission and engagement and network, trust, opportunity, renew, review and renewal. Do you um, do you want to give like just a sentence of each to give the listener a little sure. context? But let me uh, say one other thing first, because we were talking offline about whether, you know, I might mentor you or you could mentor me or whatever. The key thing is when you're looking for a mentor or a mentee, before you get to the mentoring steps, which is what are we going to do now we decided to work together, is there's two aspects of working with somebody. One is essence and the other is form. Essence is heart to heart and values to values and form is what are we going to do? And the mentor acronym is about form. But the first thing is in the book, Josh meets a couple of people that they think he would be a good mentor and there's just no clicking with them in terms of values and all. And so he passes. And I have found that advice was so powerful to me because whenever you jump into form with somebody before you've gotten essence, the essence will bite you in the tail eventually, you know. So you want to first know, is this somebody you'd be interested in spending some time with? You think that you have you share some some values uh, alike and then you can get into the form. So I think that's a good thing to talk about first. I love that. How do you um, uh, how do you engage in the essence question? Is it, you know, you have a meal with someone or you take a walk with them or you 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 engage in conversations that's outside the realm of 
necessarily what you want to be mentored about, meaning you, you move away from the do and you move towards the being and, and say, you know, are we connecting on that level? Yes. Well, that's really important. I'll give you an example of that. I, I had an idea a number of years ago to write a book called On the Power of Positive Management. So I went to a guy who was really well known as positive thinking and all. And all he wanted to talk about was form, who was going to do what, how are we going to break up the royalties and all. So I passed. And so my publisher called me and said, Ken, I heard you were disappointed with your meeting. Have you ever thought about writing a book with Norman Vincent Peale? And I said, is he still alive? You know, and he said, not only is he still family, he was 86 years old at the time. So I flew to New York, had a lunch, three hour lunch with Norman and his wife, Ruth, and our publisher. And in three hours of meeting with Norman and Ruth, there was not one form question. It was all essence. Yeah. You know, and tell tell us about yourself. Tell us about Margie. We've heard about uh, your wife, Margie, and let us tell you about us. And at the end of the lunch, Norman turns to Ruth and asks the ultimate essence question. He said, Ruth, do you think we should do a book with this young man? We hadn't even talked about what to touch <laughs> it. And she said, yes, under one condition. He said, what's that? From now on, when we meet, he will bring his wife, Margie. The four of us will work on this together. And that's I what love we love that. We did. But it was just so sweet because they could have cared less about the form. They wanted to know if uh, we were going to be able to click uh, in there. And so uh, that's such a powerful concept. I love it. And, you know, it, there's there's the wisdom of age in that, which says, you know, at a certain point, you know, I've got X numbers of years left. I want to make sure that I'm, 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 you know, what I was saying before, which is have joy and add value. And, yes. and it's, but that's, that's so, no matter your age, that is yes. the question to be asking, right? sure, which is, yeah. you know, no matter your age, in the scheme of things, it's all really short. And so that's the right. question is, where do you want to invest your life's energy and who that's do you right. want to invest it with? Yeah. And once you decide, I'd like to invest that with you or somebody, uh, then you get to the mentor model, which is a wonderful way to say, let's get the form straight. Because M stands for mission, which is what do we want to accomplish in working together? You know, all good performance starts with clear goals. You know, if people don't know what you want to accomplish, they can't get there. So it's just kind of agreeing on, on expectations. Then the E stands for engagement, which is, okay, now we know what we want to accomplish. How do we want to meet? Is it, is it always going to be face-to-face -face over a meal, or can we do some on Skype, or can we email? How do we want to engage each other? Then N stands for network. One of the important things about mentoring, no matter what the age spread, is both of you have a network of people that might be useful to the person you're interacting with to say, you know, I have somebody maybe it'd be interesting for you to talk to and all. Like I met Truett Cathy, uh, the chairman of, of Chick-fil-A, through Norman Vincent Peale. He said, here's somebody I think you'd really in enjoy, you know, because uh, he he's running a company, you know, very different than the, you know, our Center for Positive Thinking. Uh, and so T is trust, because what if you're going to have a good, powerful relationship, you got to learn to trust each other. We, in fact, I wrote a book on trust with a colleague by the name of Cindy Olmsted, who had been studying it for 20 years, and everybody has different definitions of trust. And she said, when you're in a mentoring relationship, or any, this A, B, C, D of trust, A is, does the person have the ability or skills that's necessary for what you want to work on together? B is, are they believable? If they tell you one thing, do they, you know, walk their talk to say, my door's always open and you can never get them. They got three secretaries you got to go through. Then C is that whole essence, connectedness. How do you feel about it? And then D stands for dependable. They say they're going to meet you a certain time. Do they meet then or they keep on changing it and you can never count on it? And also trust is really important. And then you get to uh, O, is, which is opportunities, which is different than network, which is here's an interesting opportunity that you might want to take a look at. It might be something that might help you on your journey and all. And then finally, uh, R is, is to review and renew, which is have a period of time where you say, how have we done to this point? 
do we want to renew or do we want to say we've really done that? So like, you know, I've written a number of books with a lot of people, and but some people I've written more than one book because when we finished one, we had such a connection and and all we said, well, what can we do next? So with Sheldon Bowles, I wrote Raving Fans and then we wrote Gun Ho, you know, and things like that. So it's a, it's, so it's a nice little, uh, uh, acronym for form. It's great. And, and, you know, you, you check out on essence, you, that's the bar that you move through. That's the door that you walk through where you say, okay, now we think about form. What are some of the challenges as people engage in the mentor mentee relationship that people should look out for? I know a lot of people who, and a lot of organizations that try to set up mentor mentee programs and, you know, some of the challenges that they face is people meet once or twice and then everybody gets busy and they stop uh, and they stop. What, what are some of the challenges you found when you, when you look at these relationships and also, you know, what are some ways around them? Well, I think that's one of the big ones is you get busy. That's why it's so important, the engagement step, which is, you know, we're not going to get busy, but, you know, we ought to at least email each other once a week. So we, we stay up to date, even though maybe we might not be because of schedule per, face-to-face for about a month, but some way to, to keep the thing going. Where they break down is you don't have the rules of engagement set up, and then all of a sudden it just kind of drifts, drifts away. You know, I, the, uh, uh, Peter Drucker said to me years ago, can nothing good happens by accident. Put some structure on it, and I think that's what's important is to put some some structure on the thing. And uh, and a lot of times in companies where they set up mentor programs, they assign you a mentor, and which is a problem because you might not have essence with that person, where if they said, I think we'd love to have, a, have you get in a mentoring relationship, and here's two or three people we'd love for you to sit with. And if you kind of find out that you got a really kind of a nice match mutually, then let that be your mentor rather than, you know, here's a new person doesn't want to say, God, this person is just not my cup of tea. (laughs) And you have some advice at the end of the book for organizations about setting up mentor programs, which I think is really important for leaders who are listening to this, who are thinking about, you know, how do we bring this into an organization in a, uh, you know, in in a reasonably codified way. Um, One question that I have is, how important is it for there to be organizational structure around a mentoring program versus to say to the organization, we value mentoring, we want you to look for people that you can learn from, we want you to ask people whether, you know, we want you to approach people, but to leave it to an entrepreneurial uh, uh, energy versus creating some structure around it that supports the process. And before you answer, I just want to say to people, we're talking with Ken Blanchard, the book, his most recent book, is One Minute Mentoring, How to Find and Work with a Mentor and Why You'll Benefit from Being One. Well, I, I think that what that people need to realize, and we've done that with our you know, work in the whole area of leadership, is that you have to have different strokes for different folks. And some people have an entrepreneurial spirit about them, and that's great to say, we believe in mentors and suggest you try to find with, but you might get somebody else who's not, doesn't have that kind of outward personality and all that maybe some structure would be. So I think it would be really good to talk with people to say, we think this this is an important thing. And would you rather, you know, kind of take the ball yourself and run with it? Or do you want some structure that we could set up and all so that you're really helping diagnose, you know, with them uh, what what might be helpful to them. And it's really interesting. I don't know what your experience is. My, as I've looked at this, Peter, I don't think uh, there's ever been anybody who's really been successful who hasn't had mentors, you know. We're doing work with the Football Hall of Fame now, and I, I've gone to a couple of times to the Hall of Fame thing. I went with when Don Shuler, who I wrote a book with, was inducted. All of the people that get inducted don't talk about all their successes they talk about the people who mentored them and who were important that got them to where they were, that they are receiving this induction into the Hall of Fame. It really is interesting. We were out there last year, you know, with 
Tony Dungy was put in and they all talked about people who had impacted their lives. And I think uh, when you think back at that is I don't know anybody who's successful who hasn't had and be able to name a couple of people that that made a difference in, in their lives and their careers. You know, I want to I want to speak to something that I have felt in myself that I've felt recently a huge turnaround in that feels important around getting mentors, which is I think that there's a sense that I know I have felt and that that I know other people feel of competitiveness that that, you know, you, you look at people who have gone before you and, and you want to you want to do better and you want to, you know, you're kind of competing and you're a little jealous and you're and, and I have felt that with people. And, and, I, and I recently had this big shift, and, and I actually have Marshall, who we talked about before, and Marshall Goldsmith to thank for this a little bit, who, who I felt a little kind of competitive with. And then I stop and I go, I'm crazy. Like, why am I, I have so much to learn. I have so yeah. much to learn. And it is such, a, it's such hubris, such ego, such a waste of energy to approach relationships with competitiveness as opposed to approach relationships with a sense of, 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 of learning and, and, uh, and you know, appreciation of, of what's been created. And I think that feels important in this conversation around mentoring because there's a generosity on the side of the mentor and an appreciation and an openness and a learning on the side of the mentee that's necessary, I think, for these relationships to really have their power. Yes. And I, what I love about the, the whole movement around mentoring is to maybe do something about this competitive thing. I've always felt one of the sad things about organizations is you go out and hire people who are either win winners you steal from other companies or potential winners, and then you put them into this performance review system where you have to screw a certain percentage of them if you're going to be a good manager. You have, you, you have to have a normal distribution curve. Now, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why wouldn't you want everybody to win if you set really good, observable, measurable goals that will help the organization as well as that person's department? And so uh, I think if we can get people off of this thing, that what you need is not people competing against each other, but how can we help each other? Because if everybody in my department wins, then we all win, you know, and why am I trying to say, oh, boy, I want to out, outrun him. And uh, there was some of that in the book with Josh, because this young guy came in, was outperforming him, you know, in sales, which was saying, making him, oh, God, you know, this guy, you know, he, he's just not even wet behind the ears and all, rather than Diane convincing him to say, I bet you could learn <laughs> something from him, you know, rather than think about competing. And that's a huge shift for people. There's yeah. a big, a big kind of, you have to confront your own fears and you have to confront your own ego and you have to confront a number of things yeah. that allow yeah. you to grow. But I think that's what's necessary for growth in general. And it's probably why you have the t title of, of chief spiritual officer. Yeah. Um, well, you know, what's interesting too is that uh, one of the reasons I've been able to write a lot of co-authored books is that I'm not a competitive person in the sense that I really want to help other people win uh, as much as I, I want to win. And so I'm not in there, you know, so I've become good buddies and have mentored, you know, in some ways, Patrick Lencioni and Tony Robbins and some of these guys who are now getting to know Simon Sinek and Brene Brown, who I think are such great up and comers. And why wouldn't I want to do anything I could do to help them? And you know what? I'm just learning tons uh, from them. And uh, so I just need, we just need to get that mind shift from you know, life is all about this competitive game rather than life is about how do you create an environment where everybody can win. I, I love that. I love that, Ken. And I want to really appreciate you for the wealth that you have shared with the leadership community and the 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 way you've shown up in a way I mean talk about Hall of Fame that has inspired so many of us and uh, and I've loved this conversation and and it's it's coming to the end but I wanted to really both appreciate you and say thank you uh, the book is 
uh, one minute mentoring, how to find and work with a mentor and why you'll benefit from being one. And I know I speak for all of our listeners when I say thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Well, it was really a joy and working with Claire was such a joy. And just show you about technology, she lives in Argentina. And so we did a lot of stuff on Skype and other kinds of stuff. And so life, life is really fun. Uh, I'm refiring, not retiring. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Ken.